This is a compilation of every comic book that featured Spider-Man and had a cover date from 1964. It's also a timeline of my editing experience so please enjoy my style and sound changes as I try to find my voice. Amazing Spider-Man number 8 part 1 Flash Thompson is bullying Peter Parker when a robot is wheeled into the room. It's the living brain, the smartest robot in the world, capable of answering any question. So the class asks it who Spider-Man really is. They feed in a bunch of information about Spider-Man and then Peter Parker is tasked with collecting and decoding the answer, but Flash tries to snatch it away. Things get physical between the two of them, so the teacher suggests a boxing match to settle their differences. Everyone is sure that the Flash is going to defeat Peter, but he's worried about using too much spider strength and killing Flash. Even with the tiniest of taps, Peter sends Flash flying, but Flash just thinks he must have tripped or something. No way that puny Parker is that strong. Meanwhile, two men are trying to steal the living brain to help them predict lottery numbers and become rich, but they accidentally activate it and it goes wild. The distraction causes Flash to look away at a vital point and Peter knocks him out cold. He carries the unconscious Flash to a locker room and uses that as an excuse to change into Spidey. He fights the living brain, but it's constantly learning and is able to counter everything he throws at it. He tries catching it in a web or keeping his distance, but the robot tears through the web and throws a door at him. Eventually, the living brain moves through threateningly towards some students and Spidey is forced to take a risky action. He jumps on the robot and reaches for the control switches. He's able to switch the living brain off while caught in his grip and swings them both to safety through a window to avoid falling down some stairs. With the living brain defeated, the two would-be robbers try to escape only to trip on a freshly awakened Flash Thompson. The students are convinced that Flash stopped them and Peter sows more confusion by pointing out that Flash was the only person that wasn't around when Spider-Man was here and he seemed awfully keen on getting hold of that paper with Spider-Man's identity. That must be it. Flash must be Spider-Man. That's why he's so deliberately lost to Peter. Since he got to punch Flash in the face without giving his identity away, Peter Parker walks home happily, whistling a jaunty tune. Amazing Spider-Man number 8 part 2 Spider-Man decides to visit the Human Torch's girlfriend to steal her away from him like a jerk and finds a party instead. He crashes it with a web bat like a jerk and when Johnny Storm gets rightfully angry the two men fight. With fire arrows, fire discs and a giant fire net the Human Torch has Spidey on the ropes when the other members of the Fantastic Four offer to help. But instead of accepting that help Spidey fights them too like a jerk. He's only stopped by an invisible Sue Storm who encourages Spidey and her brother Johnny to make up, but they refuse. Instead, Spidey insults the three men like a jerk and swings off, leaving a web harp for Sue like a creep. The Avengers number three. The Hulk has left the Avengers and the rest of the team wants to know where he's gone. So Iron Man uses an image projector to project his image out into the world. He asks the Fantastic Four and the X-Men if they know where the Hulk is. And he also asks Spider-Man, interrupting him stopping a crime. But of course, Spider-Man doesn't know where he is. He's got problems of his own. And so he's not in the issue anymore. They do find the Hulk though, and then they go to get him and he thinks they're attacking him. And so there's a big fight. The Hulk then eventually flees into the sea where he meets Namor and Namor says I hate humans and the Hulk says I hate humans too and so they team up and they attack the Avengers together. The Avengers eventually win but they are won over by Namor's fighting strength and allow him to escape. Amazing Spider-Man number 9 Across town, the world is about to meet Electro. The power of electricity is his and he uses it to rob an armored car. The next morning, Aunt May is rushed to the hospital and because of the American medical system being dumb, Peter is worried about paying for her operation. Electro's crime spree continues and he robs a bank that J. Jonah Jameson is in. And because Electro can also climb walls, JJJ is convinced that he's Spider-Man and prints that as a headline. So now Peter has to worry about an $1,000 medical bill and being a villain. Luckily, there's a reward for Electro's capture which will solve both of his problems. He finds Electro robbing a safe, webs him up and goes to grab him. Bad idea, he's electrocuted unconscious. With Electro gone, the only way to raise money is to lie and pretend that his photographs prove that Electro is really Spider-Man. Gloating about his defeat of Spider-Man, Electro recounts his backstory to himself, an electrician struck by lightning while mending wires, and then breaks into a prison to free the captives there. Peter hears about this prison break on a police radio, but he's visiting his aunt. As the prison riot takes place, he's waiting on the operation, with Betty Brandt by his side. When his aunt is safe and sleeping, he heads to the prison against Betty's wishes. How can she be with someone who likes danger so much? 
He swings to the prison, puts on some rubber gloves and boots, and then breaks up the prison riot with fists and kicks and leaps. And thanks to the rubber gloves, he can punch Electro. When Electro counters with electric whips, Spidey sprays him with a hose and short circuits him. At the Daily Bugle, Peter sells actual photographs to Jonah for cheap to make up for the fake ones he sold earlier. As he leaves, Betty confronts him, angry that he faced danger and didn't listen to her. She's about to explain a deep secret about her past, but Peter leaves angry. Even though his aunt is well after the operation, he's brooding when he leaves the hospital. Luckily, Betty races up to him and apologizes, and they walk off into the evening, groping for the right words to say to each other. Amazing Spider-Man number 10. The big man is a new masked criminal in town, and he's making Spider-Man look like a fool. He wants to take over all the gangs in New York and attacks them with his enforcers. There's Fancy Dan, fast and a master of judo, Ox, big and powerful, and Montana, an expert with a lasso. Big man has already outsmarted Spidey today, and he'll do the same for any gang leader who doesn't stay in line. Unaware of all this, Peter Parker is in hospital, donating his blood for a transfusion for Aunt May, and weakened because of it. Therefore, it's a terrible time for Big Man's gangs to be attacking New York. The police are trying to keep it under control, but can only arrest small-time crooks. With his city under siege, J. Jonah Jameson tasks his star reporter, Frederick Froswell, to write an article that proves that Spider-Man is the Big Man, apparently learning nothing after accusing him of being Electro last issue. And outside of his bugle, the enforcers are shaking down Betty Brandt for money that she borrowed from a loan shark, even after she paid it back. Peter Parker jumps in to help, but can't reveal his Spider-Man-ness. Instead, he gets beat up and lets them get away. But he quickly follows a Spider-Man, tracks them down and beats them up. But he has to escape the fight when his endurance fails him due to his recent blood loss. As he flees, he also notices J. Jonas Jameson on the street below. Could he be the big man? At home, Peter tries calling Betty to apologize for being beaten up, but she refuses to talk to him and leaves town. The next day, Peter uses himself as bait. At school, he talks about knowing the big man's identity and is quickly kidnapped by the enforcers. In a cell, he changes into Spidey and escapes, finding himself in the middle of a meeting of mob bosses. He fights them all, avoiding lassos from Montana, tires from Ox, and the judo mastery of Fancy Dan. But he's outnumbered and cornered, so he uses his spider signal on his belt to grab the attention of the police. They break up the meeting and the big man gets away. Hoping to capture the person he thinks is the big man, Spidey swings to the Daily Bugle and finds Jonah with Foswell. A policeman comes into the office to arrest the big man, and Spider-Man is proved right, right up until it's Frederick Foswell that's arrested. Later, alone, Jonah monologues to himself about why he really hates Spider-Man. That Spider-Man reminds Jonah of everything that he isn't, just by existing and doing good. Meanwhile, his enemy Spider-Man is worried about the missing Betty, and the missing Betty sits in a chair alone and cries. She has to face something alone. I mean, Spider-Man can help, but how would she ever reach him? Strange Tales 119 The Human Torch is having a bad time. His girlfriend has dumped him, he's been kicked off the football team, the Fantastic Four have gone on holiday without him, and Spider-Man keeps being in the news. It turns out that someone called the Rabble Rouser, a communist enemy of the state, has turned the public against him using a hypnotic wand. Spider-Man, who knows what it's like to be hated by the public, goes to help Johnny, but Johnny rejects the help and flies off. But because of the rabble rouser, there's now a new law about flaming on that only affects Johnny, so he has to flee to New Jersey. However, a life of crime is no good for the Human Torch, so he goes back to the city contrite, promising to not flame on, just in time to see the rabble rouser steal a visiting dignitary. With the mayor's permission, he flames on again and flies through a tunnel system to capture the rabble rouser. During their fight, the hypnotic wand gets knocked loose, and Johnny uses it to turn the rabble rouser into a loyal American. It also turns out his girlfriend just wanted to make him jealous. Amazing Spider-Man number 11. Peter Parker is mourning the missing Betty Brandt when he learns that Doc Ock is being released from prison. In order to keep tabs on him, Peter creates a spider tracker that he can sense with his spider senses. But when he goes to track Doc Ock, he finds that it's Betty Brandt picking him up from prison? So he tracks her car instead. Luckily, she also drops a map so he knows where to go. Philadelphia! Once there, he finds Betty as Peter Parker, and she's so happy that he looked for her that she shares everything. Her brother is in debt with a mob boss called Blackie, who wants Doc Ock to break him out of prison. So Betty was helping her brother achieve this. In a sharing mood, Peter decides that he's also going to tell Betty that he's Spider-Man as soon as they get home. Foreshadowing. Spider-Man is too late to stop Doc Ock freeing Blackie, and then too late to stop them from kidnapping Betty and her brother as hostages. 
He does manage to catch up with them on a boat out of the country though, and it interrupts Doc Ock's attempts to hold a coup. Spidey fights off the gangsters while Blackie reaches for a gun. The resulting tussle leads to a stray shot, hitting Betty's brother, and she blames Spider-Man for it. If only Peter was here. Angry, Spidey defeats Blackie, but is immediately put on the defensive by Doc Ock. Spider-Man is chased around the ship, narrowly avoiding the Doc's deadly arms, and when he finally gets away, Doc Ock takes Betty hostage and flees onto a smaller boat. Spider-Man follows, despite the smaller fighting space being a much more dangerous place for him, and the two battle until the boat crashes. It looks like Doc Ock got away. Back on shore, Peter consoles Betty as she mourns her brother and declares her anger at Spider-Man for causing his death. I guess Pete won't be revealing his secret to her anytime soon. Amazing Spider-Man number 12 with Flash Thompson and Liz Allen guessing at Spider-Man's identity and Peter starting to get sick, Betty Brant gets a phone call from Doc Ock. Since he knows she's working at the Bugle again, he kidnaps her to lure Spider-Man out. And since Jonah and Peter are there, he tells them to print a note to Spider-Man. Meet me at Coney Island. Spider-Man does this, but Peter's sickness is getting worse and he passes out in the middle of the fight. Doc Ock grabs him and unmasks Spider-Man, revealing Peter Parker to Jonah, Betty and the world. But since he could barely put up a fight, Doc Ock doesn't believe that this is really Spidey and tosses him away. So instead of his identity being revealed, the worst Peter has to deal with is a chiding from Aunt May and some ribbing from Flash Thompson for playing the hero. But he's made a big fan of Liz Allen, who thinks his heroics were the most wonderful thing. Angry that Spider-Man didn't come, Doc Ock breaks the animals out of a zoo, but Spidey soon arrives on the scene, defeating lions, bears and gorillas, because comics have to have gorillas. With the animals captured, it's Spider versus Octopus, and they fight across the city. They eventually end up in a sculptor studio, and their fight starts a fire. Doc Ock is trapped under a falling statue as the flames grow higher. Despite his best efforts, Spider-Man can't save the Doctor, and uses his web shield to flee the building. Luckily, firefighters are able to deal with the fire, and rescue the villainous Doc Ock, and he's dragged back to prison. As Peter once again, Parker finds himself turning down the amorous advances of Liz Allen, since he's already dating Betty, and Liz regrets ever being mean to the nerdy Peter. Amazing Spider-Man number 13 it looks like Spider-Man is a criminal again, since there's someone running around in a Spidey costume, doing all the things a spider can and robbing folks. This is great news for J. Jonah Jameson, who's reprinting all his old hate articles. It's less good news for Peter Parker, who knows it's not him, but is sure it can't be an imposter. Nobody can do the things he can. The only answer? Sleepwalking. And the only solution, never sleeping again. This leads to a grumpy Peter Parker, who gets paranoid at a psychiatrist and snappy at Betty, who turns even grumpier when Jonah refuses to give an advance to help him pay bills. It's Spidey picks or nothing. And it's not like he can be Spider-Man, because the public chase him down the moment he wears a suit. All that's left for Peter is to mope, even while Liz Allen flirts with him. Enter Mysterio, a new superhero in town who says that he can stop the villainous Spider-Man and teams up with J. Jonah Jameson to prove it. He uses the Daily Bugle to invite Spidey to Brooklyn Bridge and Spidey accepts. On the bridge they fight, but everything Spidey throws at him is countered. Mysterio can also walk on walls, he can magically stop webs, and he has a smoke that switches off Spider-Man's spider sense. Spidey is forced to flee, and Mysterio celebrates his victory with a parade. The crowd cheers for the man that defeated Spider-Man, everyone except Flash Thompson. At the bugle, Mysterio agrees to reveal his identity to Jonah, for a fee, and meets photographer Peter Parker, who slips a spider tracer into his cloak. That same Peter Parker then rushes away, upsetting Betty Brant on the way. It must be that new blonde he's been hanging around with. Using the tracer, Spider-Man follows Mysterio, who then reveals his backstory. He's a stuntman slash special effects artist who decides that, hey, he could be Spider-Man too. So he created some magnet boots to climb on walls and an acid spray to dissolve webs and then robbed some banks to frame the real Spider-Man. And he would have got away with it too if it wasn't for a pesky tape recorder that Spidey was using to record the entire conversation. Spider-Man leaps out of the sense-numbing fog and fights Mysterio across a film set. Mysterio might be a stuntman, but he's not a superhero and he's quickly defeated. Back at the bugle, J. Jonah Jameson is wrong Again, Spider-Man pays him a visit to give him a new perspective on life by hanging him upside down from the ceiling. But at least he has pictures of the earlier fight and Peter's bills will get paid. And Spider-Man is exonerated. Tales to Astonish number 57. Hank Pym, also known as Giant Man, has a gift for Janet Van Dyme, also known as the Wasp. 
It's not jewelry or perfume like she guesses, it's a weapon. It attaches to her wrist and fires compressed air, her very own wasp sting. Meanwhile and elsewhere, the villainous Egghead has learnt how to talk to ants and gives them a false message to give to Hank. Spider-Man is looking to attack and defeat Giant-Man. Hank sends out the wasp in search for Spider-Man, but only to report back. She shouldn't tackle him herself. But when she does find Spider-Man, she does tackle him herself and she uses her new sting on him, but way too powerfully. It's lucky that he has spider reflexes so that he doesn't end up a stain on the sidewalk. Spidey fights back and traps the wasp in his web, but Giant-Man comes to the rescue. Spider-Man's response is simple and stupid. Well, if you want to fight, I guess I'll give you a fight. With the three heroes fighting, Egghead starts step two of his plan. He calls the police and reports the fight, drawing the police away from his real target, a payroll truck. Egghead's gang rolls up in a purple lorry with a winch, pulling their target truck into the back, and the police can't stop them because of the traffic caused by Ant-Man and Spider-Man's fight. But luckily, a lone ant spots Egghead's escape and warns Giant-Man, who stops fighting Spider-Man long enough to chase after the real villain on the back of a flying ant that he controls telepathically. At Egghead's hideout, his loot is whisked away to the ceiling on webs. Spider-Man has found them. Then his henchmen are blasted by compressed air. The wasp has found them too. Then Giant-Man shows up too, hurling the rest of the goons around in his giant form. They win the fight easily and everyone rejects Egghead's offer to share the loot with them. But the wasp still doesn't trust that Spider-Man and he wants nothing to do with her. Something about the natural spider-wasp rivalry. So they just keep on being jerks to each other, even when they're allies. Amazing Spider-Man number 14. We start with our very first look at the Greed Goblin working on a flying broomstick. He's here to give the Enforcers orders. Remember them? Fancy Dan, Montana and Ox? Well, they work for the Green Goblin now and they want revenge on Spider-Man. Across town, a movie producer doesn't want revenge. They want another big hit after the nameless thing from the Back Lagoon in the Murky Swamp. And that's exactly what the Green Goblin promises him. A new hit movie with the Green Goblin, the Enforcers and the actual real-life Spider-Man. Days later, Peter Parker hears about a green man on a broomstick and leaves a flirty Liz Allen to investigate. When he clashes with the Goblin, he's told about the movie offer and soon Spider-Man himself is signing on to his first major motion picture. Also, lucky for him, the Daily Bugle want Peter Parker to take pictures of that very film. But unlucky for him, his smile makes Betty think that he's just excited to be around Hollywood dames and that blonde Liz that he keeps hanging around with. In New Mexico, where the film is being shot, the Green Goblin and the Enforcers offer to rehearse privately with Spider-Man. But then throwing real punches and Spider-Man realizes he's walked right into their trap. He's fought the Enforcers before and dispatches them easily, but the new foe, this Green Goblin, is harder to beat. The Green Goblin's bombs do enough to distract Spidey until the Enforcers can get the jump on him, literally. They try to hold our hero, but he's too strong and throws them off. And before they can find him again, he uses his web and some tumbleweed to spin up a dust storm to hide. Meanwhile, back at home in New York City, we check in on the three women in Peter's life. His Aunt May is writing worried letters to her nephew. Liz Allen is arguing with Flash Thompson, who thinks she's only interested in Parker to make him jealous. And Betty Brant is trying very hard not to think about all those glamour girls from Hollywood. Back in New Mexico, Spidey hides in a cave and uses the shadows to web away the Enforcers. But when Goblin brings the fight to Spidey, one of his bombs awakens the Incredible Hulk, who's been hiding here. The Hulk instantly blames Spider-Man and attacks him, and the Green Goblin just takes a step back and lets the fight happen. But it's not a long fight, as Spidey quickly realizes that it'll be a fight that he will lose and escapes the cave to freedom. But he can't just leave, not when the Enforcers are still webbed up inside the Hulk's cave. So he sneaks back in and rescues his villains. By the time Spider-Man gets back to the movie producer, the Spider-Man picture has been cancelled. The producer wants to make a Hulk film instead, and Spider-Man is left without a paycheck. He gets just enough money to get back to New York. Arriving in New York before Parker, however, the Green Goblin returns to his secret lair, and convenient equipment blocks the reveal of his identity as he unmasks. He underestimated Spider-Man this time, and he didn't expect the Hulk, but he will bide his time to strike once more at the Amazing Spider-Man. Amazing Spider-Man number 15. Our story starts with Spider-Man busting a seemingly normal robbery, but the leader of the criminals is actually the Chameleon, who uses disguises to escape. And in his secret apartment, the Chameleon wants to dispose of Spider-Man once and for all, and he knows the perfect man to do it, Craven the Hunter. A week later, Craven is due to arrive in New York City from Africa and be greeted by the Daily Bugle press team as well as Flash and Liz. For the first time, Betty and Liz meet and Betty is frosty. Craven arrives by boat and is called handsome and rugged and then is able to subdue some escaping snakes and a gorilla before Spidey can even get his costume on. 
When asked who he's here to hunt, Craven answers that he's hunting the most dangerous man of all, Spider-Man. Jonah is mad at Peter for not taking pictures of Craven. Betty is mad at Peter because Liz exists, and now Craven wants to hunt him. Peter's not having a good day. Later, Craven watches Spider-Man fight from a nearby rooftop, learning all he can about his quarry. But Spidey spots him and brings the fight to Craven sooner than he'd have liked. The hunter is on the back foot, surprised at how strong Spider-Man is, but manages to nick him with one of his special potion weapons. Spider-Man is poisoned and flees. The next morning, Peter has recovered from the poison, but can't stop his hands from shaking. He's able to hide it from his Aunt May, who has set him up on a date with some lovely niece of his neighbor. He's also able to hide it from the bitter Betty and a frugal Jonah at the bugle, and he even runs into Craven leaving the office. But he's a laughing stock of his chemistry class when his shaking hands lead to broken test tubes. Soon Peter learns why Craven was leaving the bugle, as the headline reads, Defeat of Spider-Man imminent. The only thing he can do is bring the fight to Craven. But that is exactly what Craven's expecting. It's a trap. At night, Spider-Man finds Craven at the park, but it's a decoy Craven, and the real Craven springs a trap. While Spidey is able to avoid a net, he's momentarily distracted by a drum beat and has manacles strapped to his right arm and leg. The manacles are magnetic, and as Spider-Man tries to flee, his arm and leg are trying to pull themselves together. Using all his strength to avoid the magnetic pull, he deactivates a lamppost and plunges the park into darkness. Then, using his web fluid, he clogs the manacles, breaking the electromagnetics inside. Now it's Spider-Man's time to hunt. He finds one Craven easily, but unmasks him to discover the chameleon in disguise. And then he stalks the real Craven through the dark park with his spider signal to scare the hunter into being foolish, avoiding all the traps that Craven has, and then trapping Craven in a web. With Craven defeated, he can take the key and free himself. But he can't free himself from a terrible love life because Betty apologizes to him and asks him out that night, but he's got a date with a mystery girl. But then it turns out that mystery girl has a headache, so he tries to ring Betty, but she she just blanks him. Then he tries to ring Liz, but she's out dating Flash Thompson. So he goes, dateless, dressed as Spider-Man, to watch Craven and the Chameleon be deported. Amazing Spider-Man 16 Aunt May doesn't care about relationships. She wants Peter Parker to date the niece of her neighbor and won't take, I'm already in a relationship, as an answer. So Peter flees to his Spider-Man persona and swings around the city. As he does, he notices a blind man being hassled on the street and comes to the rescue. But as Spidey swings away, that blind man turns out to be Matt Murdock, also known as the superhero Daredevil. Daredevil swings back to his office where he finds his friends Foggy and Karen inviting him to the circus. But something sinister is afoot at that very circus. They have some kind of ominous plan and they're going to use Spider-Man to lure people there. After Peter finds a poster for the event, he decides that Spider-Man will go. It is for charity after all, but when Peter drops a circus ticket, which he absolutely doesn't need to have if he's showing up Spider-Man, he upsets Betty, who thinks that he's dating another woman. The circus show begins with ominous words from the ringmaster, wearing a spiral hat. Spider-Man turns up to applause and does an incredible acrobatic performance. The audience loves him. The ringmaster wasn't really expecting him to show up, but that's not going to stop him. He steps out and hypnotizes everybody with his hat, including Spider-Man himself. With almost everyone in trance, the circus begins to rob everyone of their belongings. But I say almost everyone because Daredevil is blind, didn't see the spiral, and so remains untranced. Daredevil goes to stop the ringmaster, but with Spider-Man under his control, the ringmaster just sends Spider-Man to fight him. The two heroes are equally matched, but Spidey is slower because he keeps waiting for hypnotic orders and Daredevil uses that to his advantage. Daredevil steals the ringmaster's hat back and uses it to bring Spidey out of his trance. Then Spider-Man takes on the entire circus, from trapeze artist to strongman, while Daredevil slips back into the guise of Matt Murdock and returns to his seat. Just as Spider-Man defeats the evil circus, the ringmaster has his hat once more and attempts to hypnotize Spider-Man again. But this time, Spidey has his eyes closed underneath his mask. The hypnosis won't work on him, and after knocking the ringmaster out, he uses the same hypnotic hat to bring the audience back to waking. As the police cart the evil circus away, Spider-Man is sad he didn't get to know Daredevil better. Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number 1 And this is a long one In prison, they have removed Doc Ock's arms Making him just an ordinary, jacked doctor again but he can control his arms telepathically and uses them to break out of jail. Once free, he sets up a meeting with the other villains that Spider-Man has fought before, Craven the Hunter, Electro, and Mysterio. They're just waiting for two more members to join them. After all, the Sinister Four just doesn't have the same ring to it. Elsewhere, Peter Parker catches his Aunt May in the attic, looking at pictures of his Uncle Ben. 
Filled with guilt, Peter swings away and remembers that fateful night that he let a burglar get away and that same burglar killing his Uncle Ben. On a rooftop, he thinks about how much he hates being Spider-Man and how he wishes he was normal again. And then he is. He finds himself tripping off a roof and even though he can catch himself from falling, all his powers are gone. He slinks home powerless and goes to bed leaving Aunt May worried about him. At that very moment, the Vulture turns up at Doc Ock's meet. Alongside the Sandman, he makes up the sixth member. Doc Ock fills them in on the plan. Since none of the villains will work as a team, they will fight Spider-Man separately, weakening him on every encounter. They draw their order from a hat. The next day, Peter is still feeling sad about his loss of powers. He wanders off without eating breakfast, and his Aunt May thinks he must be something to do with that new girl he's seeing, Betty Brandt. When she finds out that he didn't show up for school, Aunt May heads into the city to speak to Betty. And so they're both together when the sad man and Electro turn up and kidnap them. They're taken to Doc Ock's hideout and Aunt May immediately forgets about Uncle Ben and starts crushing on the man with the robot arms. Vulture informs J. Jonah Jameson that Betty has been kidnapped and he informs Spider-Man. But Spider-Man doesn't have his powers. Still, that doesn't stop him from going to location one to fight villain one. Electro. At an electrical factory, Electro tells Spider-Man that he has a card with the next step of the trail to find Betty, but Spider-Man will have to defeat him first. Electro then hurls a bolt of electricity which Spider-Man dodges? Wait! He dodged electricity! That means he has his powers back! He keeps on dodging thrown bolts until he finds some wire and uses that to ground himself. And because he's grounded, he's not affected when Electro zaps him and he gets close enough to punch Electro unconscious in a glorious single page spread. At the Daily Bugle, Jonah tells his staff not to bother him as he desperately calls the Fantastic Four to see if anyone has found Spider-Man yet. At the second location, Spider-Man is ambushed by two leopards and Kraven the Hunter, but he has his superpowers now and he's super quick and he has webbing, so he easily fends off the animals and then steals the card with the next location from Kraven's belt and swings away, barely a scratch. As he heads for location three, he turns down help from the Human Torch, one of the many cameos in this annual that I've edited out for time, and Aunt May is enjoying tea and biscuits with her new octopus themed suitor. At location 3, Spider-Man has to fight the X-Men. He manages to dodge Cyclops' beam and smash Beast, discovering that they were robots all along. Since he no longer has to worry about hurting the good guys, he makes light work of the remaining Robo X-Men and discovers Mysterio behind a metal wall. Even in a cloud of smoke, he easily punches and subdues the villain and then rescues the card from the fire. As Spider-Man swings to the fourth location, J. Jonah Jameson is still worried about Betty and still unsure that Spider-Man knows what's going on. When a spider turns up in his office, he just assumes that Spider-Man must have sent it and argues with it when it won't give him any message. The fourth fight with the Sandman seems like an easy one, but when Spider-Man leaps through Sandman's body to get the location card, he activates an escape-proof iron cell. This almost seems like the end of Spider-Man. Spider-Man until Sandman realizes that he made the cell too perfect, too airtight, that there's now no oxygen to breathe. So Spider-Man escapes while Sandman slumps unconscious. At the bugle, Jonah finds out that all the other papers in town have been reporting on Spider-Man's four fights. But since he told nobody to bother him, the bugle was doing nothing. Everyone in town has scooped him. The fifth fight with the Vulture is high above the city and starts with an ultimatum. Vulture wants Spider-Man to take off his web shooters or he'll simply fly away, so Spider-Man agrees. As he finishes removing them, Vulture fires oil at Spider-Man, making him slip and then lassoes Spidey's leg. But with his superhuman speed, Spider-Man turns Vulture's lasso against him, swings up on top of him and webs him to a building. At the Bugle again, Jonah discovers that the Bugle hasn't sold a single copy in the last hour. The last location for Spider-Man is an old castle. He breaks in to find an armless Doc Ock, who keeps him distracted until his octopus side ambushes Spider-Man from behind. But Otto gets too cocky, and a well-timed punch sends him reeling and the arms let go of Spider-Man. But this is only step one of Doc's plan, and he soon lures Spider-Man to a trapdoor that sends him into a glass tank. With the water stopping Spider-Man from leaping around, Doc Ock attacks with his arms, dragging his foe underwater. But Spider-Man discharges all of his webbing into the tank, tangling the octopus doctor up and securing victory. With the final villain defeated, Spider-Man soon finds where Betty and Aunt May are being held, and finds that his own aunt thinks Spider-Man is ghastly and villainous. So he swings away again and returns as good old Peter Parker to find that his aunt was more worried about missing her favourite TV show than any of the danger she was in. Elsewhere in prison, six men dressed in green, purple and yellow argue about whose fault it is that Spider-Man bested them once again. Amazing Spider-Man issue 17 The Green Goblin has some new gadgets and has been practicing on a dummy of Spider-Man. He's also not riding a broomstick anymore, he's riding a glider. 
I'm not sure it'll stick. At school, Flash Thompson is starting a Spider-Man fan club. Ironically, he won't let Peter Parker join. Parker is so boring, he'd probably faint if he ever saw the real Spider-Man. But minutes away, Spider-Man is swinging up to a helicopter to thwart some criminals, only to find out that it's a film set and the criminals are actors. What an idiot! Jonah finds all of this hilarious and Sam Raimi is inspired four decades later. As Peter walks with Betty and tries to forget his embarrassment, they bump into Liz and Flash. That Spider-Man fan club is holding a meeting at a club that Liz Allen's father owns and Spider-Man will be there. As Liz invites Peter to join, much to Betty and Flash's annoyance, his spider sense goes off. There's something very suspicious about a man in the crowd. But by the time he can change into Spider-Man, the suspicious man has been apprehended by Johnny Storm, the Human Torch. Everyone loves Johnny and everyone hates Spider-Man and Peter just can't figure out why. Instead, he's just jealous. Before we get to the first official meeting of the Spider-Man fan club, two more things take place. Jonah schemes with Betty to put dampeners on the meat, worried that a fan club will make a hero of Spider-Man. And Aunt May still wants to set Peter up with this mystery girl who will discover is also a big fan of Spidey, but she's sick with a bad cold. So then we get to the meetup. Everyone is there. Betty, Jonah, Flash, Liz. Also, Johnny Storm with a date and the Green Goblin. After Spider-Man comes on stage to roaring approval, a frog is thrown at him and it explodes and snaps his web. While Spidey can land safely, the Green Goblin flies in and assaults him with goblin sparks, bats that release smoke and pumpkin bombs. In the crowd, most people think it's an act. Betty is happy that Peter isn't here since it means he can't like Liz all that much and Liz is wondering why she never sees Peter and Spider-Man in the same room. Jonah hates how much of the crowd loves it and Johnny Storm is the only person who sees it as real. So, as the Human Torch, he intervenes to help. While the Torch and the Goblin fight, Spider-Man decostumes and shows up as Peter. He makes quick small talk, flirts with Liz just enough to make Betty mad and then dashes away. The Human Torch is losing to the Green Goblin when Spider-Man comes to the rescue. The Spider and the Goblin fight once more. The goblin gets a good punch in and then Spider-Man runs away. His fan club can't believe it. Jonah loves it. Spider-Man has turned chicken. Only Flash stands up for Spider-Man as the crowd leaves disappointed. With no Spider-Man to fight, the green goblin stuns the torch and leaves his battle a success. But why did Spider-Man leave? It's because he heard a phone call that Parker's aunt had had a heart attack and was in the hospital. Nothing was more important than getting to her bedside. He makes it there and spends some time with her in hospital and then leaves only to find everybody calling Spider-Man a coward. Why must Peter Parker always pay for being Spider-Man? Amazing Spider-Man issue 18. The last we saw of Spider-Man, he was running away from the Green Goblin and the world reacts to this. Villains are sad that they weren't the person to win. Heroes are sad because they misjudged their fellow hero and J. Jonah Jameson is smiling because he always said that Spider-Man was a coward. The actual Spider-Man, shy Peter Parker, is taking care of his Aunt May and worrying about affording medicine. To help raise some money, he wants to sell his rights to a card company, but no one's buying the cards of a cowardly superhero and they turn him down. To help relieve his stress he wants to break up a crime but he can't risk his life with a sickly aunt may at home so he just calls the police instead to help his loneliness he calls betty but she's not talking to him after seeing him together with liz in the last issue alone poor and sad peter thinks about how his villains just keep getting stronger and he gets nothing out of being spider-man except pain the only person who is having a good time in all of this is jonah who is crowing on the news this just makes things worse for peter after visiting some scientists to try and sell them his webbing formula, which doesn't happen because it dissolves too quickly, Spidey bumps into the Sandman. Of course, if he's not going to stop some random robbers, he can't fight the Sandman, so he doesn't. He runs away and hides. The whole world sees this secondary act of cowardice, especially Jonah, who keeps playing it on repeat on the news. People are in shock. Johnny Storm in particular can't believe it. There must be something going on. So he leaves a message in the sky in fire to meet with Spider-Man, but Spider-Man doesn't show. The last person in the world still standing by Spider-Man is Flash Thompson, who angrily threatens anybody who has a harsh word to say about Spidey. To prove that Spidey is still a hero, Flash dresses as Spider-Man. He hopes that the real Spider-Man will come to rescue him if he gets in trouble, or that he'll stop a crime dressed as his favourite hero, but he doesn't. He just gets beaten up. Peter Parker without a costume is ready to save him when the police arrive. Instead, Flash is left angrier, not knowing why his hero didn't show. Peter Parker has lost his confidence. He's lost his fans and his allies. He's lost the respect of the people of New York. And when he sees her with another man, he discovers that he's lost Betty too. There's only one thing to do. 
he quits being Spider-Man. And that was the end of the character, and I guess the end of this series. So thank you all for your support and your likes here. There's no reason that he would change his mind, especially not in the last two pages of the issue. But I'll, I'll check anyway. So Aunt May is missing from her wheelchair when Peter comes downstairs, no longer the amazing Spider-Man. When he finds her, she lectures him about worrying too much. Parkers are tough folk. They have a will to live and to fight. So when Peter looks at the bugle and sees a headline about him being a coward, he realizes that that same will to live and fight is inside him. So he recovers the costume from the trash and he's Spider-Man once more. And I guess this series continues. But seriously, thank you for the support. Amazing Spider-Man issue 19. After giving up the mantle for all of five minutes, Spider-Man is back, stopping criminals with flips and kicks and making J. Jonah Jameson sad. Later and elsewhere, the Human Torch is flying home from an encounter in one of those non-Spider-Man comics when he is ambushed by the Sandman and the Enforcers. They use a chemical foam and Sandman's body to douse Johnny Storm's flame. Then they lock him away in a glass container without oxygen to flame on. As Johnny languishes in that glass prison, things look up for Peter Parker. His aunt is well and making breakfast, and his classmates love Spider-Man again. As he leaves school, he spots Fancy Dan from the Enforcers. He follows him to a criminal hideout, where he enjoys being able to easily win against those very criminals, dodging through lassos and singing songs. It's only the arrival of the police that puts a stop to the fight and lets the Enforcers slip away. Later, at the Bugle, Betty introduces Peter to the man she has been dating, Ned Leeds. But because everything is working out for him, Peter doesn't really mind. Not even an angry J. Jonah Jameson can affect him. Instead, he just shows up as Spider-Man to mock his boss. In search of the Enforcers, Spider-Man leans on an informant, but answers come way too quick and too readily and Spidey suspects a trap. So he uses stealth to rescue Johnny. He hides in the shadows and crawls across ceilings, avoiding everybody on watch. He even has time to set up a camera, but he doesn't notice the sand resting on top of Johnny Storm's cell and that quickly becomes the Sandman. Now fighting Sandman and the Enforcers, things are looking rough for the webhead. So to even the odds, he flings himself at the glass of Johnny's cage and grants the Human Torch enough oxygen to live up to the torch part of his name. Together, the Human Torch and Spider-Man make quick work of the villains, working wonderfully together as a team. That is, until they wind up tangled up in a web together as the Sandman escapes. Luckily for our hero, Sandy only escapes into the arms of police officers and surrenders so he doesn't have to fight our two heroes again. At the bugle once more, Peter is able to cheer up Jonah a little with exclusive pictures of the previous fight. Everything is working out for him. Except, he doesn't notice a man in a purple suit. A man that knows about Peter Parker and follows him home. A man who calls a mysterious person, plotting some kind of plan. They just need to know something for certain, and then they'll act. The Avengers Issue 11 Tony Stark is dead, and mysteriously Iron Man has gone missing, so the Avengers meet to grant him a temporary leave of absence. But, watching from the year 3000, the villainous Kang realizes that this is the perfect moment to strike. He creates a robot of Spider-Man to send back to the past and lure the Avengers to their doom. Robo Spidey bides his time until he can come to the rescue of Captain America, who is fighting some goons that were also sent there by Kang. After the rescue, fake Spidey asks Cap to join the Avengers Avengers, but the other Avengers are less convinced. Ant-Man is wary of Spider-Man, Wasp just hates spiders, and Thor wants new members to pass some tests. Mechanical Spider-Man doesn't need that stress, so he pretends to leave, throwing out that he knows where Iron Man is as he does. He's eventually convinced to stay, and he reveals that Iron Man can be found in a temple in Mexico. Ant-Man and the Wasp are the first to arrive at the temple, where they are ambushed by the electronic Spider-Man. It's a tough fight, but it ends with Ant-Man tied up in webbing that will grow and shrink with him, and Wasp swatted by a web fly swatter. But Thor spots the fight and enters the fray. Motorized Spider-Man is quicker though, and when Thor throws his hammer, counterfeit Spidey traps it in webs. 60 seconds pass and Thor becomes Donald Blake once more while trapped under webbing and he's now too powerless to escape. Three Avengers down and one to go. But somebody else is watching. 
Fraudulent Spider-Man is there to greet Captain America when he arrives and tries to drop a block on him. The two superheroes fight before Cap has his face webbed up and is pushed off the temple to his doom. Mock Spider-Man is victorious. In the year 3000, Kang reveals that he's been using a gas to weaken the Avengers and he commands his robot Spidey to transport the Avengers to the future. But phony Spider is stopped from doing just that by the real Spider-Man who has also saved Cap from his fall. The two Spider-Men fight each other before the robot of the two is hurled towards the jungle. When the robot uses his webs to make wings, the real Spider-Man follows in kind and they meet in the air. With his hands free, the real Spider-Man is able to shut off his duplicate circuitry. The Avengers regroup, realize that they were fighting a robot and also realize that Kang must be behind it. And in the future, that very Kang is angry to have failed once again. You made it to the end, so thanks for watching. I release a new issue recap every Thursday, so hit the bell and subscribe if you want to catch up with the latest ones or wait for the compilations. Do whatever suits your lifestyle. You'll also find informational videos about the Spider-Man issues that are coming out in any given month, some interviews with some interesting Spider-Man creators, and there are some video essays on the horizon.